Um... <laughs>
Now I need to change that. Welcome, everybody. <coughs> change my background. Okay. And <coughs> We'll take the pin off. Hello, John. Hey, there's one. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, you're in the uh, lounge there? Yeah, but I'm going to change my background. Oh, okay. Well, it looks real. It looks uh, on the job. <laughs> Let me see what I can do here. Okay. Hey, you work on that. I'm just going to get things ready here. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. I gave the link to the engineers, so they should be joining. Uh, okay. Let me know what format you'd like to proceed with. You want me to introduce them briefly and then whatever you'd like. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll just, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's not informal. It's not really rigid. Uh, I'll just introduce myself, introduce TV, and then, then I'll introduce you. And then it's, you run the show, basically. Okay. And I'll be asking and I'll try some to, questions. I'll, I'll so. try to assist when, uh, not technically, but if someone wants a question or something like that. Yes. Perfect. I told them to, to go over lecture part for about... Um, perhaps 30 minutes or so, and then, um, then Q and A, and then, um, they can, they can, uh, show some of their innovations for 10 minutes or so, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. Well, just, excuse me, just for a second, uh, Juan, and anybody in the panel, a uh, neurosurgeon, <clears throat> hello, you don't, you don't have to talk. But if you'd like to, Mario, Thomas, Ruland, or Imran, uh, please say hello now. That's okay. Because I, I, I don't want to make people talk, Juan. You know, it's like if they don't want to talk, they don't, they don't have to talk. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 
Okay, I'll be back. Yep. Okay, just testing to make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Hola, Michelle. Okay. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Good, good. I just wanted to join early to make sure everything worked here. Let me check my video too. Um, oh, hi. Where are you from, Michelle? I am joining everyone from Raleigh, North Carolina area, uh, but I work with the team that's based in Memphis. Uh, for oh, Metro great. Science, so. Oh, great. Yeah. A scientist. Yes, my background is in science and engineering. So, um, okay. yeah, it's easy to do more of my work remotely because I work. Well, with we like to have you guys around more often. Yes. <laughs> get, you, get you away from the boring work you do at the desk and everything, you know. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm looking yeah. forward to it. So, Good. Um, okay, we'll be starting in about. Uh, everyone's coming at the last minute. Okay. <laughs> of course, as a producer, you go, oh, you're kind of like wondering, are they going to show? <laughs> so, I... these guys, Juan, how you doing, Juan? They, they like to come at the last minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's all right. That's all right. It always... I have noticed that Medtronic meetings run over all the time. Um, I joined Medtronic through a tiny from from Titan Spine, which was very, very tiny. Um, and it was different there. You you showed up to meetings five minutes early. Oh. Medtronic, there's so many meetings you, and they go over, you don't usually show up on time. <laughs> yeah, Juan, I can't believe you're a free diver. Yeah, you didn't know that? Oh man, you must be insane. Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's what I do on my free time. I, I actually I'm actually I actually hold a couple of national records for my for my home country. Really, uh, yeah, Peru. Cool. Now, ever go to the Bahamas? They have some really good free dive spots there, don't they? And, uh, and, and some of the out island. Uh, I usually go to uh, Dean's Blue Hole in the Bahamas. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I'm looking at a message here from Keith. Uh, he's saying that this interface is not Zoom, can turn on mic. This is interesting. I think you just have to promote him like you did myself to a panelist to allow him to unmute. They say there are a couple minutes delayed. Okay, one second. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we have a conference from Venezuela in a couple of weeks. And one from, um, let's see, uh, Colombia, I think. Colombia?
I think Keith is uh, trying to get in. Oh, okay. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I got him. Hello, Gerald. Hi, how are you? I'm John Bennett. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And uh, I think you probably know Juan. Juan, do you know? Uh... Hey, how are you, Gerald? Good, good. I don't know if we've ever met. Nice to meet you. No, nice to meet you. We never met, I think. <laughs> and I'm on now. Thank you. Hey, how are you doing, Keith? I'm Keith. John Bennett. And nice. nice to meet you. And Juan uh, Valdivia, who's going to moderate the session. This is, uh, this is going to be pretty informal, so we're just <clears throat> eager to listen to you guys. Um, Keith, everything okay on your end? Yep, I'm good now. Thank you. And we're waiting. Oh, Jeremy. Jeremy is Jeremy in? Okay, hold on. Let me, Jeremy's not in yet. No wonder. So Jeremy is going to present. Jeremy and Gerald, they're going to have two separate presentations, right? Uh, one? Um, that's up to... Um... Gerald, right? Jared? Uh, yeah, actually, it's, it's a combined presentation. I think Jeremy pulled all of us in. So um, myself, Keith, and Michelle are all going to present parts of the presentation. Oh, okay. So is everybody inside? Looks like it. Everybody here? Yes. Yep. Yes. Good. Okay, here we go then. Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon, this is Dr. John Bennett from Neurosurgical TV in beautiful Miami Beach. We have the honor today of having a webcast uh, uh, with Medtronic um, Spinal Implant Material Science. And we have Juan Valdivia, a spinal surgeon from Tampa, Monterey. Uh, welcome, Juan. Hello, thank you very much, John. Uh, this is going to be an informal setting for um, basically gaining knowledge on spinal uh, implants materials and um, technology. So um, we're going to have some questions and answers, and this is going to be posted, I believe, in YouTube afterwards. So let me uh, see if I can introduce our speakers. We have Michelle Gallagher, uh, principal R&D engineer, and then Keith Miller, um, Senior Distinguished Engineer, Gerald Redmond, Distinguished Engineer, and Jeremy Black, Senior R&D Engineer Manager uh, for Medtronics. So I'd like to give uh, Gerald the post now. You can go ahead, Gerald. Yeah, well, oh, I'll jump uh, in quick. Oh, go ahead, Jeremy. Yes, yeah, so I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen and um, get us kicked off. I'll let me know when you can see my screen, please. Yes. Perfect. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, as Dr. Badivi was mentioning, um, the presentation today will be regarding medical device material science, regarding implant and instrument applications. And I'd like to introduce the team today as um, Dr. Badivi has just done. So today's presenters will be uh, again, myself, Jeremy Black, Senior R&D Engineering Manager, uh, Michelle Gallagher, Principal R&D Engineer, Gerald Redmond, Distinguished Engineer, and Keith Norris, Senior Distinguishing Engineer. Um, it's okay, I'll do a quick introduction of some of my history. So um, I've been uh, in, the, in the workforce for about 14 years now, working specifically in um, medical devices, both in dental and orthopedic applications, and have uh, spent a lot of time in the post-market activities or post-market area of emphasis, understanding about um, our materials, processing, and applications of both instruments and implants. And so I'll pass it over to Michelle. Just do a quick as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I came, I've been working in the industry in spine um, for about 12 years now. Um, I started in a tiny company called Titan Spine, um, which developed the nail lock surface technology. And so my focus is really um, around the preclinical studies and development of that type of technology. Um, and then I came to Medtronic through that acquisition. So um, I now work on our technology development team um, in the applied research division. Thank you, Michelle. And we'll pass over to Gerald. 
Hey, my name is Gerald Repman. I'm a distinguished engineer with the Medtronic Spine business um, in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I've been <clears throat> working with Medtronic for right at about uh, 20 um, years now, uh, or a little over 20 years, um, and roles both in our cardiovascular business as well as our spine business. Um, background is um, in biomedical engineering and uh, emphasis in material science. Um, and so, yeah, glad to talk to you guys today. Keith Miller, I'll go quick since I know we have short on time. Um, been with Medtronic 26 years, and the last five years been heavily involved with 3D printing titanium enterprise devices. Excellent, Keith. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. All right, Gerald, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, so, you know, to start things off, uh, we did just want to touch kind of more generally on, um, you know, kind of considerations that take place when we're thinking about materials for medical devices. And I think um, when you think about, you know, medical devices and things that are going to go into the body or interact with a patient, it really all starts with biocompatibility and biostability. Uh, so biocompatibility is really that question of, um, are you going to have an adverse response <clears throat> by the host uh, when this material comes in contact with them? And then biostability is, is the material going to be able to maintain its intended performance within the host over time? And so that bubble chart at the top kind of really gives you a good indication of kind of the um, space that we end up having to operate in when we think of, you know, developing medical devices is that we're considering patient conditions and, you know, how is this going to interact with the host tissue, um, the material properties that um, we're looking for, and then what is the function that we need for the device and where those areas overlap is kind of that narrow window of uh, opportunity space for us for selecting materials. And that chart at the bottom just kind of gives you a sense of, you know, if we're looking at materials that need to have high strength or high toughness, um, if you look across the spectrum of all materials, you see that um, there's a quite a bit of range in how the properties of different types of materials perform, whether you're looking at metals or ceramics, um, composites, or polymers. And, you know, if you were looking for something that really had both high strength and toughness, it's going to push you more to metals or composites. If you were just looking for strength, you could probably go with something that's a ceramic where you get the highest performance. But those are the types of considerations that we have to take into account when we're looking at um, materials for these devices. And then particularly when we think of it being a medical device, we've got to narrow our selection within this overall space. Uh, we can skip to the next slide. So this is uh, some data taken from the ASM um, handbook for materials for medical devices. I think that chart at the top kind of gives a really good uh, overall description of kind of those the considerations that go into uh, selecting materials relative to implantable uh, materials. And so we talked about that compatibility component, you know, making sure that it's biocompatible, making sure it's biostable. And then when we think about, you know, what is the function of the device, we have to go through what are the particular uh, properties of the material that we need in order for it to perform the intended function um, inside the patient. But there also are manufacturing considerations that we have to take into account. You know, is the material capable of being fabricated into the product? Can we hold tolerances on this material consistently? Um, what's the quality of the raw material that we get in? You know, is it gonna vary too much for um, this application? Um, can the material be exposed to sterilization processes? Um, because that's going to be important in order for it to be implantable, um, as well as cost can be a, a, an important consideration. And so ASM lists a group of uh, materials that have historically been used for um, implant applications. And this is not a holistic list, but you can see it kind of lumps us into the different groups or categories that we were talking about earlier with metals, ceramics, polymers, and composites. And I've highlighted on here materials that have been more traditionally used for spinal implant applications. Um, and so you have your austenitic stainless steels or your 300 series stainless steels, um, your titanium and titanium alloys, uh, cobalt alloys, um, and you know, nickel titanium alloy as well has been used in some limited applications, which is the, the nitinol alloy. Um, and then if we look over at polymers, um, the polyether, either ketone or peak material has been the primary material used um, in spinal uh, applications. You want to jump to the next slide? All right. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction on the general materials, Gerald. And so similar to Gerald's presentation slide, um, again, this slide represents more of the general implant materials 
I'm going to give you a perspective of what those materials look like. And so, as Gerald mentioned, you have your titanium alloy or your, in your CP tire, commercially cured titaniums. We have our cobalt chrome materials and also nickel titanium alloy or night and all. Um, what this table represents on the right side here is a kind of a representation of the yield point or strength as Joe showed in his previous slide, as well as the stiffness. Um, again, depending on the application of the technologies or the materials in, in you know, human applications, you wanna make sure that the product that you're using meets the application. And so, for example, if you were to use a rod for a, um, say a scoliosis correction, you wanna have a pretty stiff rod so that you can maintain that correction. And so, um, uh, up at the top right, you can see we have a, a, a rather large stainless steel rod. Then all the way at the very bottom, we have uh, our smaller titanium alloy rods. And also, um, as Joe mentioned, some of our peak rods. And so again, for these alloys and applications, you want to make sure that you have a, a, a very uh, you know, robust biocompatibility, understanding of the materials. Um, as, as we've looked at on the prior slide, biocompatibility is, is very important because again, if, if you use material that um, is not biocompatible or biostable, then you can have adverse reactions and poor responses to your customers. Um, when you look at the post-processing or the secondary processing, you need to also ensure that that product can be cleaned mm -hmm. so that these materials do not have any um, additional manufacturing uh, fluids that could have an adverse reaction. I know historically um, we have seen cases where that has led to uh, monumental recalls, but uh, in this case, um, you know, the implant materials we've selected and commonly use are, are considered safe and effective, and they also demonstrate the uh, metallurgical response that we need as far as uh, stiffness, yield point, and robustness, so that during cyclical um, applications, they're not fatiguing prematurely. And so um, just kind of a high level, high level review of the implant materials, um, and then I'll jump to the next slide to go over general instrument materials as well. And so. Um, when designing instruments, um, you typically want to have an instrument that is made of material that uh, meets your intended function. So, for example, if you're using a, a cutting tool or a uh, scraping tool, you may use something like in the, in the 400 series range, which could be your, your 420s, your 455s, your 465s, to, to give you that applicability, uh, as well as with screwdrivers and uh, any, say, rod benders or plate benders as well. Um, you look at your, your, your 600 series, you have your 17 fours, and that'll give you more applications for you know, drills, drills and taps. Um, that'll give you the application for uh, a specific function. And so um, holistically, you know, at, at a high level, uh, stainless steels, you know, we want to have them in a manner that they're very corrosion resistant. They're very corrosion resistant. And so typically you know, these alloys will include some chromium which again helps to reduce the amount of, uh, or the likelihood of ferric oxide creation. And so once you've chosen your material, uh, we'll then do a uh, secondary processing or passivation step to keep that mm -hmm. surface passive to prevent corrosion. And then that gives you, a, a, again, a, a little bit longer time before the instrument could be, or could become uh, corrosive or lose its ability to be, or remain stainless, as we would say. And so uh, again, the, the chart at the bottom is another representation of what different types of materials um, look like. Uh, some of our suppliers have provided us visibility, visibility as well as um, kind of performance metrics of, you know, which grades of steel are stronger or more ductile, more, um, more likely to, 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 you know, to fracture or to plastic deform under use. And so again, that's how we typically try to identify the types of applications. And so with that being said, you know, if you're using a screwdriver and an implant, you want a material that will more or less plastically deform instead of create a, a brittle fracture, which would create uh, potential risk to the patient. So again, when you're looking at metal applications or material selections, those are some of the areas of opportunity to keep in consideration. And so I'll pass it back over to Gerald for our next slide. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. <clears throat> so, you know, I think, you know, just to kind of touch back on what Jeremy was, was just highlighting, and you know, when we started thinking about um, instruments, you know, you know, devices that are going to come in contact with the patient, uh, but they're not necessarily going to you know, stay in long contact with the patient. Um, one of the key things that, you know, happens quite a bit in spinal applications is these instruments are reusable. Um, and reusable instruments are exposed to a number of harsh conditions. Um, you have the high forces from how they're loaded during the surgical procedure. Um, you can have contact um, with abrasive surfaces, contact with body fluids. Um, they can get exposed to cleaning solutions, um, sterilization, heat and moisture. 
um, just the handling of the parts, whether they get dropped or potentially inadvertently overloaded, uh, vibrations from shipping, um, as well as whatever storage conditions they're put into. All of these can have an impact on the surface properties and the overall mechanical properties of these parts. And so, you know, when we think about these, you know, relative to instrument applications, it really, you know, even narrows our focus a little bit more in terms of what types of materials uh, we use for these applications. Um, in the metal space uh, for spinal applications, it's mostly around the use of stainless steels. And this is particularly the Martin Siddick stainless steels or your 400 series stainlesses, some of those, um, you know, materials that Jeremy touched on on the previous slide. Um, and these materials have a benefit that they can be heat treated to a higher hardness so that you can boost up the yield strength and the ultimate tensile strength in the material without significantly impacting ductility. Um, and that gives you a, a material that's going to um, perform really well and be very robust in a um, reusable instrument application. Um, there are also con considerations relative to wear. Um, and so like Jerry mentioned, some of the 600 series stainless steels as well as these 400 series stainless steels are, are going to perform really, really well in contact conditions where there could be abrasion and wear that could take place. Um, titanium alloys are um, used in some instances, and one of the real benefits of titanium is that its stiffness is quite a bit lower than stainless steels or cobalt alloys, um, <clears throat> but the material can be processed to, to really good strength. Um, so you can get a high strength uh, material, it's lower stiffness, it's a lightweight material in terms of its density, um, and so you can get you know, something that can be um, easily to manipulate and handle. Um, but, you know, another real good benefit of titanium is it's highly corrosion resistant. It's probably the most corrosion resistant metal uh, that we use for um, medical devices. It also has the benefit that it can be anodized to imply color on the surface. So you can use it to uh, color code instruments and uh, help with um, identification of the correct tool to use for the surgery. Um, and we touched a lot on metals, but you know, there are also polymers that are used for um, these applications. Um, silicon is a, a polymer that's used quite a bit, um, and particularly around use of um, you know, things that uh, give you better grip. And so an example is like that blue handle shown on the screen. Um, and silicon is a soft, durable um, polymer. It gives you grip and it's both heat resistant and chemical resistant. Um, we also have polysulfone and polyacetals. And so these are more hard plastics uh, polysulfones or materials like Radel uh, shown on that uh, tray on the side, whereas semi-transparent um, is a hard polymer. It's uh, heat resistant, uh, works very well, well for these um, trays and packaging type considerations. And polyacetal, um, its trade name known as Delrin, is another good hard durable material. It has low friction um, and chemical resistant. And you can see an example of that on that mallet where the, the soft ends of that mallet are made of polyacetal. You skip to the next slide. Um, another thing we did want to touch on here briefly is around the ideal of corrosion. Corrosion is something that can really impact the performance um, of materials, particularly metallic materials. And corrosion really is just an electrochemical reaction uh, between that material and its environment that involves oxidation of the surface. And so this oxidation reaction um, can result in um, generation of a byproduct um, and loss of material on that surface. And so in, in essence, you're having oxidation reduction reactions that involve metal ions on the surface interacting with oxygen within the environment um, that they're exposed to. And that ends up stripping material away from the metal. Um, and there are a number of different forms of corrosion and this becomes very important for uh, reusable um, instruments, but it also can impact um, implantable materials as well. Um, but if we just kind of look across that list of possible corrosion, um, you know, the areas that we probably struggle with the most with um, implantable materials, um, as well as um, instruments, is around localized corrosion, such as pitting and crevice corrosion, uh, where you can get um, either surface disruptions in the passive layer that forms on these metals, or, um, you know, evidence of um, corrosion reactions around grain boundaries on the surface. Um, that can result in pits on the surface. And so you can see some of those on the images on the screen where there's a pretty uh, heavy localized corrosion attack where you've got quite a bit of pitting on the surface where you disrupt the metal. Um, that can um, not only cause you know, discoloration and um, you know, kind of a, a cosmetic issue, but it can also result in a potential for fracture of that material. Crevice corrosion is another one where you've got um, gaps or small holes on the surface of a part. Maybe they were designed into the part 
or you have a um, assembly where you've got some overlapping surfaces with a small crevice, you can have corrosion in between those surfaces. Uh, fretting corrosion is another important one for spinal uh, applications, even particularly the implant applications where we're creating spinal constructs with posterior fixation with screws and rods. Um, you have contact between components where you're already getting an abrasive interaction. And if you put that into a corrosive environment that can be accelerated through a corrosive reaction. Uh, galvanic corrosion also plays into the, the question with spinal implants. If I'm putting in multiple components that are made of different materials, if these materials have dissimilar um, galvanic potentials within that medium, they can create essentially like a, a circuit between those materials where there's an electrical path that um, one material acts as an anode, the other acts as a cathode, and you can have a corrosion reaction where the anode is stripped of this material. Um, and it can be a pretty aggressive attack if the materials are very dissimilar. And so we have to really pay attention to make sure that the galvanic potential of these materials is, is pretty similar so we don't uh, have that behavior take place. And then the final one there is just stress corrosion cracking. And this is where um, we can have pre-existing defects or cracks at a microscopic scale, but at, under a stress condition, those cracks may be stable, but through being put into an environment where there's also a corrosive medium or an activity where you can get corrosion, uh, you can have those cracks actually accelerate in their growth as a result of both the combination of stress and corrosion. I think that was it for the introductory slide. We'll kick it over to Keith next. Uh, to touch like on we, have a, we have one question, uh, Dr. Vadivia, please. Um, yes, um, um, Gerald, so the galvanic corrosion, the most common example in clinical practice will be to connect a uh, titanium implant with a stainless steel implant. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's where you start to get a little bit of a difference in the galvanic potential. And so I think that's where, you know, in a spinal application, we, we do want to try to avoid those types of interactions. Uh, the biggest difference where you have a, a significant potential for galvanic is when you pair a more noble metal, um, where, you know, noble metals are metals that do not corrode, like gold or platinum, uh, with something that is a um, less noble material like an aluminum. Um, that's where you'd have a, a really high potential for acceleration of uh, a corrosion reaction due to galvanic. Thank you. Right. Okay. So, so um, the FDA calls the 3D printing that we, that we use in our devices laser powder bed fusion. Um, many companies have their own trade names for it, but I like to use the FDA definition of it. Um, the way it works is basically you have a layer of titanium powder on a build plate and a laser comes back and it melts that, sol that powder into a solid geometry. And then you have, we call it a recoder, basically spreading another layer of titanium powder, just like right here. On top of that, then the laser comes back and does, does it again, basically. So multiple layers and you end up with solid geometry in the end with this layer wise process. Um, you see this bottom image, this is like one of our systems where we got like 200 different implants in one build. And this, would, this particular link system would print in 24 hours. So 200 would print within 20, 24 hours. Next slide, please. So I'm really gonna talk about pros and cons of 3D printing for titanium inner body devices, because really all we use at Spine here is titanium alloy. Um, we don't use different materials, we just use that one. And if you just wanna look at the material, the one thing to note is basically 3D printed titanium alloy has let lower fatigue strength than wrought titanium. Um, and the way we design around that is we basically make the walls thicker. We basically just make things stronger to accommodate the fact that the material is a little bit weaker. Um, that weakness can be due to the grain structure. Um, and also when you 3D print devices, they have a rough surface um, compared to machine machine devices. And anytime you have a rough surface, you're introducing a fracture point where fatigue fractures can initiate. Um, this image here to the right, you actually see some porosity in there. That's actually when we're kind of learning the reading printing process and we didn't have our parameters straight. So you don't want porosity in the device, but if companies are, do not have their laser parameters correct, then you can actually get porosity within the device. Next slide, please. Oh, Chris, uh, sorry, Keith, real quick. I think uh, there's one more question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, Dr. Vadeva, did you have a question? No, not, not at the moment. Okay, sorry. I saw your, I saw your hand was so raised. Apologies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so what they, Keith? So 
to explain how we use 3D printing to design our bio devices, uh, I like to go over the, the, with some of the design, consider design considerations that we use, at least I use when I design a device. Um, there's more to it than this, but this is a good kind of overview. First is fatigue strength. You want to make sure that the device can handle the loads within the patient throughout their life. Um, second one that's kind of unique to 3D printing is impact strength. Basically, if you have a lattice structure in your antibody device, then impact strength can become a concern. I'll go over that a little bit later. The next three concepts I kind of made up my own. I mean, that's kind of the way I'd like to describe it. One is bone through growth. That's basically your graft chamber in the middle of the device. You basically would like a large column of bone growing from one vertebra to the other. Another concept is bone on growth. That's if the bone actually attaches to the device and connects to the material itself. And another one is bone in growth. If you have a porous surface or a lattice structure, you have the opportunity for bone to grow actually into those pores and into the device. So I call that bone in growth. Another design consideration is migration. You don't want that device slipping and sliding on the end plate. You want to stay where it's at. Um, stiffness. Some people think that inner body stiffness affects fusion rates. Like with Wolf's Law, um, it doesn't really, but there's a perception that it does. So we try to take that into consideration. Uh, radiolucency. Um, you know, you want to be able to assess the device after implantation, then subsidence. We want to make sure that this device doesn't subside into the vertebra. You keep your, your disk space open. Next slide, please. So 3D printing gives us pretty much just three features that are beneficial. Oh, I see a hand raised. Hey, uh, question for you. So when you, on your last slide, when you say subsidence, will you speak about on um, the modulus of elasticity? at some point. I don't um, have it in my slides, but I can talk about it. Yeah, yep. whenever. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'll get to this and I'll talk about that. Um, so really with 3D printing, it gives us the opportunity to, to put three features in devices that you can't do with machining. Um, one is a rough surface. I don't know if you can see my, at the top of that image, you see a rough surface there. We can actually engineer a rough surface that promotes bone on growth. Um, so that, that's, the pro, that, that's the pro of that rough surface. You got bone on growth, and when you have bone on growth, you have less migration of the device. Uh, the con of that, though, is fatigue strength. I basically added more little notches on the surface of the device where fatigue fractures can start. Um, a second thing you could do with 3D printing is you could do a lattice structure. Um, that's basically you know pores where the bone can grow into. So if you have that, the pro of that is you can have bone in growth, which also prevents migration of the device um, add porosity to a material, it should be more radiolucent. Um, and so one thing to consider is whenever you do a lattice structure, your walls of your device have to be thicker. Um, lattice structures aren't as strong as solid material. It's just, that's not the way it works. So what you do is you end up making the graft chamber smaller in the device to, to accommodate a lattice structure, okay? Well, when you do that, you actually end up with more surface contact area with the vertebral end plate. So mm -hmm. we kind of... So you, yes, you, make, you have less graft chamber volume, but then you have more contact. So you do reduce your subsidence when you do that. Um, right. and, and then there's so stiffness too. So you are decreasing, the material itself has less stiffness, but you're adding more of it. So it's kind of a trade-off. It's like you have thicker walls, but those walls are porous. So it, it can affect the stiffness. Um, it, but does that matter? How, nobody really knows. Nobody's done a scientific paper on that. Um, but once again, a con is fatigue strength. All of these, the con is a fatigue strength. Basically, I have a material that has pores and notches all over it. So that's places for fatigue fractures to start. Um, a con is your graft volume. You basically, if I had to make my walls thicker, then I have less graft, less graft chamber to put bone in. And then there's impact strength. Um, Lattice structures are great if you have uniform loads across those graph uh, across that device of that structure. Um, but if I have point loads and I impact loads at that, then you, that is not that strong. Basically, you could have fractures at those locations where you have point loads on a lattice structure. Um, the FDA has what we call the MOD database, M-A-U-D-E database, where you can look up complaints for different devices. And most 3D printed interby devices that have had issues are lattice structure devices with that have basically fractured during insertion and to me that's impact forces that's what's happening there um 
We don't really use lattice structures as our devices, and we have never had a single device that has structurally failed. Um, so I think we made a pretty good call not going that direction. I'm not saying lattice structures can't be designed correctly, but you just have to make sure you take those impact forces into account when you design a lattice structure and design the device. Um, and then another thing you could do with 3D printing is hollow structures. You can make little undercuts that you can create if you were to machine a device. Um, this can increase your graft volume. It could help your radiolucency because you have less thick walls. But then again, it's the trade-off with the fatigue strength. I got thinner walls, then it's going to get less strong, basically. Um, and I'd like to show you how we kind of use these features to design our devices. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have three devices in the market. Arctic is a T-lift device that push on the anterior rim of the end plate. Adaptix is the T-lift lift device. Then our anterior line TL is a lateral, laterally, lateral device coming from the lateral oh. aspect. Next slide, please. So, and here's what we do, basically. We use 3D printing to provide rough surfaces. On the, um, the top one, which is Arctic, we had what we call it a tyonic surface. It's basically a rough surface that bone attaches to, and it helps with migration, it keeps it from migrating. Um, on the top bottom two devices, we have our nanolock technology, the macro roughness from that nanolock technology. Michelle will tell you more about the nano aspects of it. Um, but again, it's a rough surface that prevents migrate, that allows for bone on growth and prevents migration of the device. Also, we have a honeycomb that we put on our devices. Um, that honeycomb provides more surface area for bone on growth. Um, you know, bone on growth, you're preventing migration, but also when you have that surface area distributed over a larger area, you're decreasing your subsidence, just like with a lattice structure. You have more contact along the end plate, so less subsidence. And then with the holes within the honeycomb, you have bone in growth, and, which helps with the migration of the device within the, the space. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing we do is not really a 3D printing benefit. You can do this in a machine device too, but on this middle device, Adaptix, which is the only one of these that I actually designed myself, I made sure I had large side windows on the device. Um, so that was my attempt to make it more radiolucent. You can have a, a lattice structure material, which is less dense, or you could just have large windows through the device. And I chose the less the large windows through the device. Um, and also this reduces the stiffness of the device to make it closer to bone. Um, then hollowed out graft chamber. You can't really see in these images, but on the noses of these implants, it's really hollowed out. So when you pack bone, it can go up underneath that surface. Um, and also in this bottom device, you'll see these little ledges along the outside of the honeycomb. We like that because when you pack these devices with bone graft, those ledges kind of hold that graft in place and it doesn't fall out. Um, so that's one thing, graft containment's good, increases your graft volume, but also the more material you remove, the titanium you remove, it helps with radio lucency. Um, so and that's pretty much all I have, but I'll, regarding your question regarding modulus, that's a, that's a tricky question. Uh, it's, it's always a hard one to answer because go back, actually go back up two slides, I think. Maybe one slide. Yeah, two, one yeah, more. I there think that's, a, that's an interesting you. You know, point because you know, the more we look at interbody uh, implants and the algorithm of uh, decision algorithm to choose which one to, you know, which implant to, to choose, then the issues of subsidence, uh, lattice structure, density, stiffness come come to mind. And I feel like surgeons should be more knowledgeable on all these concepts. Yep. Anyway, go ahead. Yep. So right here, you see stiffness and you see a spring. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I can make a spring out of stainless steel that has a very high modulus of elasticity. Okay. It has nothing to do with the modulus of elasticity. It has to do with the design because the spring is not, it's not stiff. It's very, it's not stiff at all. It's very flexible, okay? So then you have peak, which has a lower modulus of elasticity, but I could put a huge chunk of peak in there and it's stiffer than a stainless steel spring that has thin walls. So modulus mm. elasticity can come into effect, but really all you care about is stiffness of the design. And the material plays in the design. Now, get me wrong. There's a combination between design and material. Um, lattice structures, yep, they're going to be less stiff because, you know, you have a lot of air in that structure, but then again, I'm making those walls thicker. So it becomes stiffer again. And, and peak, yes, it has a less modulus elasticity, but then I'm making those walls thicker as well. You know, mm. it's, 
it's, it's such a subjective, I mean, we've never, I've never seen a good research on the subject where somebody has actually compared apples to apples mm. devices and showed clinical data to show one's better than the other. You know, then nobody is going to get a, like my adaptex and make it out of a peak and Mm -hmm. compare the two because you can, for for one thing, you know, it would fail in fatigue strength and fatigue. Um, But that's, Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, it's, it's always been a tough one to sell um, or to explain really, because we don't, we don't have the data and I don't know anybody that does really. So the design of the reference on a clinical paper. I do have a good oh. reference here where they compared two devices, different materials, one peak, one titanium. So oh. if I'm allowed to, I can send it over. Yeah. After. Uh, but think so. Yeah. No, that's so. great. That's great. This is important because um, you see the pattern uh, of uh, election of uh, interbody implants is uh, there's no there's no gold standard and. No. There's so many options, so many brands, so many models, how yeah. to choose. And it's interesting that you say design rather than modulus, because when I was a resident, modulus of elasticity, we have to memorize it. And yeah. but really it's a design. Yeah. It's you know, true. so who, where modulus of elasticity came from is the peak industry. The companies that developed peak and started selling it to us medical device companies. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh uh, I, I wasn't in marketing, so I could blame our, our own people. But basically, we had our own marketing people take that and ran with it. And they were selling it. And that wasn't just us. It was all every other orthopedic company known to man was doing the exact same thing. They were taking the peak industry's mantra and preaching it to everybody else, basically. Um, and a couple of us were like, scratch your heads, like, okay, have fun with that, you know. <laughs> um, but it's, I mean, honestly, the best thing about peak in my mind is the fact that it's radiolucent. Uh, and if you could get bone to attach to it, mm-hmm. that'd be the perfect material, you know, but you know, we're having, yeah. there's some, ch- and there's ways of doing that, but then cost becomes an issue. So it's, there's always a trade off. But, but the literature recently, at least in the last 10 years is showing that the metal produces more osteoinduction and osteoconduction than peak. Is that correct? I thought that's what I said, what I saw in the literature that people that actually, I don't know, but you, you tell us. Oh, Michelle's, the ex, Michelle's expert there. And that's the great segue into Michelle. Great. Yeah, it's a great segue. And I don't know if I included some of the studies on comparing to peak, but we do have studies um, that came out of the Titan surface technology literature that compares peak smooth titanium and to textured titanium. And yes, osseoconductivity is increased with metal as opposed to mm. peak, just from a chemistry perspective. Mm. So yeah, this leads into my slides. I'm going to talk about surface technology with specific focus on the Titan Nanolock surface technology. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is a really high level overview with a lot of complexity into it. So I'm going to try to help you guys understand what all of this means, but this is an overview. The Proprietary Nanolock Titan surface technology is a macro texture on the inferior and superior surfaces, so the, the bone contacting surfaces. And then there's micro and nano textures on all surfaces. Um, and those textures at the micro and nano levels have been shown to upregulate the production of osteogenic factors, meaning bone factors, and then angiogenic factors, so blood supply, blood growth. Um, and what's really unique about Nanolock is that it's specifically engineered um, at the micro and nano textures. The textures aren't just there by default. They were purposefully um, engineered that way through controlling the manufacturing process. And the goal was to mimic the bone remodeling process. So I'm gonna go into some of those details, Um, but if you look over on the right-hand side of the screen, there's some of the uh, inner body devices where we have nanolock on the surfaces. And then below is um, an image of an actual mesenchymal stem cell just uh, on the surface of the, the nanolock technology. So after 24 hours after being put on there. So if you go to the next slide. 
So when you talk about surface technology, it's important to understand that there are a couple different terms as it relates to the hierarchy of the texture. So at the scale that we can see, it's called the macro scale. And that's where the, on the end plates of a lot of our devices, you can really see that, that that was the texture that Keith was talking about earlier. And the primary function there is to resist expulsion and migration. Um, and so it's that mechanical interaction uh, with the, the end plate and the surface. And then you get to the micro level, which is important for load transfer um, between the living bone and the implant. Um, and then you get down even smaller on a very small scale and you have the submicron and the nanoscale features. And so on the micro scale, you're around the size of the cells as you can see in the middle. When you get to the submicron and the nanoscale, you're smaller than the, the cells. And it's so more about the interaction from a protein level. And so it, it's for bone matrix only and it supports the cellular formation, bone formation response. So if you go to the next slide, um, I just want to show you kind of what the where those scales are on the um, inner body devices. So this is just an example with the endoskeleton TC device with nanolock technology. So the bone contacting surfaces are in the top and the bottom, um, which would contact the end plates. And then the non-contacting surfaces are like the inside of the cage. And at the macro scale, they look different. Um, but then when you get to the micro and the nano scale, they look the same. So mm. if you want to go to the next... So, so which, I'm sorry, can I, can I ask you a question? Sure. So in your last slide, so the nano, uh, at the nano level, they all look the same, you said, right? Mm -hmm. So really, I, the, which, which level then is the most important one? The micro level and the macro level, I assume? Uh, and of, of which, of both, which one is the most important one in regards to expulsion, resistance, and, and friction? Sure. So in, in regards to expulsion resistance, I would say the macro um, is really what's going to provide that implant stability and prevent mm -hmm. migration from happening. When it comes to the cells, you're, the micro and the nano level combined influence the cellular response. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that is um, by just reviewing some of the bone remodeling uh, process, um, the drill and fill um, concept of that. There are two types of cells involved in bone remodeling, the osteoclasts. Those are the cells that remove bone. And then you have osteoblasts and those are the ones that come behind the osteoclasts and, and lay down and form bone. So osteoclasts, when they're breaking down the bone, they prepare a cavity and it's called a resorption pit. Um, and that gives a signal to the osteoblast to come and lay down bone there. And so Nanolock was designed to imitate these osteoclastic pits. So give that signal to the osteoblast that this is an area that they might want to put down bone. Can you go to the next slide? So this is just an, another iteration of uh, and references to how we know that the nanowalk surface technology imitates bone. So on the left-hand side, you can see that's a, an image of an actual osteoclast after it's uh, put down its resorption pit and, and fold up some of that bone. And then on the right-hand side, it's a, an optical profilometry three-dimensional image of the nanowalk technology. And where all those little stars are, those are the what we consider the pits that are like osteoclast resorption pits in their size and shape. So they're approximately about 30 microns in di diameter and about like 10 microns in depth, which is what it is about the, si the same shape as osteoclastic resorption pits. Mm. Can you go to the next slide? Oh, I don't know why the image, mean, there it goes. Um, so we didn't stumble upon the nanolock technology right away. We try and testing different combinations of grip blasting and acid etching to try to produce different surfaces um, to mimic that bone remodeling process. And so there were a little over 36 different surfaces that we looked at from a visual standpoint with SEM. And then we narrowed that down to three surfaces to evaluate in cell culture and see how cells would respond. So if you look to the right, there are images of the different surfaces. Number nine is actually nanolock now. Um, and we compared it to the endoskeleton surface or the rough titanium surface here, which was the, the original surface technology for Titan spine. 
So if you go to the next slide, it's some of the outcome markers that we had from this study. Um, and there were three key factors that we looked at when we want, were deciding on the surface. Um, the BMP levels and BMP is responsible for upregulating the osteoblasts. So we wanted to make more osteoblasts for more you know, bone onlaying. And then we looked at the osteoprotegrin le levels. And as osteoprotegrin goes up, it means that you're down regulating, meaning you're stopping the osteoclast. And so we wanted to see the osteoprotegrin levels also go up. And then the last one was the VEGF levels, which are an angiogenic factor. So upgrading, regulating blood supply. It's important not only to have the cells there to make blood, but also the bone, or I mean, sorry, the blood um, to supply them the nutrients. So in all three of these areas, the number nine surface outperformed the other surfaces. So that's how number nine became nanolock. And then... Next, um, we've done some further research to confirm nanolock improves cell response. I'll go through this quickly. We looked at cell adhesion and it improved in the first 24 hours with nanolock compared, here's my one on peak, compared to peak smooth titanium and the endoskeleton reference surface. We had higher migration velocity. So the cells moved over the surface at a faster rate. Um, there, we had improved morphology, or that's a fancy word for shape. So if you look to the right are the different shapes of the cells, the peak and the smooth titanium are these really elongated cells that are typical of fibroblasts and uh, fibrous tissue. So fibrous encapsulation, which is commonly seen with peak. The endoskeleton surface started to change its shape and become more osteoblast cell-like, but the nanolock surface at 24 hours had this stellate morphology, pretty much looks like a star, which is more typical of osteoblast, mature osteoblast cells. Um, and then we looked, we also confirmed that all of these measures aligned with osteogenic markers, similar to the previous study. If you go to the next slide, the last thing we really wanted to look at for nanolock was inflammation response. So we did a study and looked at the different interleukins um, for inflammation and nanolock decreased the pro-inflammatory pro interleukins and increased the anti-inflammatory interleukins compared to peak. So last, um, we've more recently had some clinical uh, outcomes come in from some of our partners. And so I'm just going to review one of the studies that they did. It was a retrospective cohort study. I mean, it examined opioid consumption after putting in an ALIF um, with either the standard control surface, which was the endoskeleton technology or the nanolock surface. So, um, and what they found in their research was that the daily MME um, used at the baseline and all post-op time points was lower with the nanolock cages um, versus the endoskeleton cages. And then they did a regression analysis and found that there were two variables that influence opioid use um, if the patient was a smoker and then also um, the surface type of the antibody cage. And I believe that's my last slide. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> and so to wrap up the presentation on materials, uh, we do have some uh, some labeling information we need to, to prepare or to present regarding the uh, application of these uh, implants that were shown are for US audiences only. And so I'll quickly go through those that we just covered. And again, we covered Arctic and we also covered Adaptix and then we also covered the Titan analog information. And so if there's any questions or um, follow up, then um, the information and questions can be either sent to myself or Gerald or Keith or Michelle or Brian, your shows are up, Dr. Valdivia. And, um, that's all we have. Thank you all for your time. Mm -hmm. This is a this is very good information. Um, so, um, a couple questions uh, for you guys are for what you've seen in um, the industry in general. Do, are all the instruments for implantation, like inserters and inside to benders, are all those made of stainless steel? I would say that 99% of them are, at least for, uh, for us. Um, we might have certain components within them that are not stainless steel, but a screwdriver is a version of stainless steel. Or, you know, osteotomes are stainless steel. So yes, yeah, they're stainless. Okay. Yeah, I agree with Keith. There are some, some applications of um, titanium, um, you know, particularly when you need lightweight instruments, but the vast majority are stainless. 
Yeah, gotcha. sometimes you'll see night and all springs put in things. Um, and then with silicone handles. Yep. Right, right. Um, the other question I had is uh, the night and all uh, guide wires. So those are, the, what are the specific physical properties of night and all regarding temperature? Because I've seen that, um, uh, you know, they behave differently than stainless steel, for example. And if there's, I've seen more, let's say, fractures than not on night and all guide wires versus stainless steel. Hmm. And what is, what does that depend on? Depend on temperature or, or friction or, or bending force? What, what is that? Uh, what do we say? Yeah. Yeah. You know, nitinol is a, a unique material. Um, it's a material that can undergo a, a crystallographic um, phase transformation where the material can flip between two different lattice structures that allows it to undergo a tremendous amount of strain, but recover that strain back to its original shape. And in most applications, like with a guide wire, that's going to be using what's known as the super elastic behavior of nitinol, where it acts like a super spring. So if you put a lot of bending deflection on that, where if you were using a traditional metal, you would reach the yield strength of the material and it would plastically deform and you'd have a permanent bend in that component. But with nitinol, it allows it to undergo that phase transformation and it can accommodate that strain. And then when you release it, it'll spring back to its original shape. And the problem with that is it's, it's called pseudo elastic behavior. So it's not truly elastic behavior. There is deformation that's happening within the crystal lattice. And that's one of the things that makes processing of nitinol very important. Another component component of that is the fatigue strength of light and all tends to not be quite as good as what you see with other traditional metals. And so that could be one of the issues that you see with guide wires over time, if they're flexed quite a bit, particularly through that transformation strain, um, you're ac ac accumulating damage in the material and that can result in a fatigue fracture. Okay. Yeah, I've seen uh, the few times I've seen night and all guide wires fracture have been not actually the, the uh, the ends of a guy where the, the poles not in the middle. So mm -hmm. I wonder if it has to do with temperature, you know. Notching um, is another consideration. If there are night and all's uh, toughness is not quite as good as some of the other traditional metals. So if there's any kind of surface finish disruption or notches on the surface, uh, that can result in a, a fracture, a premature fracture. Yeah. And that's what I'm, that's why think that maybe temperature has something to do with it because every time like there's different products in the market but i've seen night and all guide wires to the holder structure holder memory and then others that do not and they basically just deform as you see you see them deform as you get you're using them and i yep. feel obviously suboptimal not your product but somebody else's product and i thought that was definitely suboptimal um, That's a, the, the weird thing about the material, you can create that phase transformation effect through either stress or temperature. And so, you know, if you heat the material up or cool it down, you'll also, you know, you know create the phase transformation where through the heating process or cooling process, you can make it become a spring or you can make it become a very ductile material. Um, but when you process it as a super elastic, you know, material, which is typically what they were used for a guide wire. It's, it's going to be a uh, stress induced uh, transformation. So, as you bend it, that's when it undergoes the phase transformation. Gotcha. Yeah. And exactly that's what happens when, when I've seen it before. If the tip of the uh, guide wire is beyond the screw and the angle is just a little bit off, like one degree off, it will bend the tip of the guide wire. And by the time you want to pull the guide wire off, it will, it will break at the tip. So, the, so the tip will stay on the vertebral body, unfortunately, and that has happened. That has happened, um, and uh, with no repercussion, no, there's no clinical significance. But you wonder I, why would that happen? So. I wonder, and I'm, I'm just making this up, but I wonder if it's the fact that it is so flexible. So normally, if you had a stiffer material, what it would do is it would force the screw onto the guide wire along that path but if you get really flexible yeah. at the end it's going to start bending and bending oh now i'm bent so far that i have no choice but to break basically correct correct yeah 
And it could yeah, be you're overcoming the, the the even the transformation strain. So that's you know it does it can accommodate a lot more strain. Typical metals is around 0.2 percent before you start to undergo um, non unrecoverable deformation or plastic deformation. Nitinol is you can get in the range of about six to eight percent, but if you undergo a significant bend, you're potentially even going beyond the six or eight percent. Now you're getting to the point where you can break the material. Yeah. Um. Gerald, do you know if stainless guide wires, they're not made of 316, are they? Uh, or do you know? I'm not sure. Um, okay. That's a good that question. Way, at least at least and all is biocompatible. So if you have a little piece, yep. as long as it's not migrating anywhere, it should be safe, you know, from a material yep. standpoint. Um, stainless, it all depends on what type of stainless. 316 stainless is biocompatible, but most other ones are not. Right. Mm. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I stayed away from using nitinol on the guide wires because of that uh, that experience, but perhaps it's not, you know, if, if you use stainless steel, a type of stainless steel, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good either, right? Because if that fractures, then it wouldn't be biocompatible. Right. Um, interesting. Um, unless, it's, unless it's 316 stainless, then in that case, it's fine. 316 is the only one, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, there might be others, but that's the only one I've ever used. Yeah. Um, the other question was uh, comparing rods that are um, titanium versus color chrome. The difference in the basic difference between um, the point of fracture and um, rigidity. So titanium is obviously easier to bend and do inside to bending and you know shaping with a with a French bender, but color chrome is much more difficult. Now, what, what do you recommend from your products to, obviously it's ideal to bend, the, to do the least amount of deformation of the product, but what happens with cobalt chrome? Is that more fragile when you bend it, let's say once or twice at the same area versus titanium? Uh, and when does it become more fragile or more, more uh, brittle, if you will? Okay, and now keep me honest here, Gerald. Um, so it's been, I was I haven't worked with rod systems in 12 years. So I'm and really we came out with a lot of our cobalt chrome rods after I left that group. So I'm not an expert. Um, but I do know that one of the reasons we came out with cobalt chrome rods is that they can be easier to bend in a way. Um, with titanium, in order in order to bend titanium that far, I have to bend it that much further than it flexes back to that. Curve. It's basically Correct. more elastic. Okay, cobalt chrome. Yeah. I could bend it there, and it stays. So, yeah. so in a way, cobalt chrome is easier to bend, but co co cobalt chrome does, is more susceptible to strain hardening. Which is basically, if I bend it that way, then it makes it that much more harder to bend it back the other way than titanium. So, multiple bends, cobalt chrome is more difficult. If you just do it right the first time, or you're just bending in the same direction the entire time, then cobalt chrome is better, basically. Um, as far as fracture strength after the bend, I, I can't say. Uh, we have uh, one of my coworkers could tell you, but I, I don't know. And we could get back to you on that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Keith is exactly right. You know, that um, you know, spring back effect with titanium, that's you know, one of the things that makes it difficult to um, get the shape. So you have to overbend it to get the shape, but the elastic modulus of titanium is a lot lower than that of uh, cobalt chrome, about half. And so it gives you that initial feel that it's gonna be easy to bend, but to hold that particular shape, you have to overbend it. Um, the other point, you know, to the point you're talking about with uh, fracture notching of these rods is a, a key consideration. You know, the tools that are used to actually create the curvatures, um, e even though they're roller um, components, they actually can put um, notches and um, burnishing yeah. marks along that surface, and that could be a key contributor to fracture. Yeah, even even the inside to benders more so, I would say, because it's not a roller, you know, contact surface. It's it's a real, yeah. I've seen that for sure. Um, that, that's definitely concerning when you do it on the points of uh, stress, like the apex of the curve or the top of the construct. So, very good. This is very good material. Would you, uh, is there a way you can share with us a contact email for surgeons that would like to hear more from you guys or check your products uh, before we go into your uh, your showcase uh, innovation product? Because I'm sure people would like to contact you. Sure. 
Um, do you have an email list we can send them to you, or you want us to type up on the screen right now? How do you? You can you can just show it on the screen. Yeah, so it's just put it in the chat. Yeah, if you'd like, if sure. you'd like to. Well, you know, I think this is a good start uh, to have a product webcast, industry webcast, because obviously everybody wants a better product. And if we can increase interaction with people like Juan, who have been in the field, to give their feedback, uh, you know, Juan and other spine surgeons, they're busy as heck. And they may pass you in the hall or something and mention something about it. But this gives them a chance to really go deeper into, into what they see as product and their and their insights. You think you think Juan? Like you guys yeah, ask a lot of questions. Uh, you probably haven't asked because you don't have the time to sit down with an engineer, obviously. Uh, and the engineers mm -hmm. don't have time really. They're busy. But this platform allows it. Yes, I think these are. And concepts that are very important to surgeons and residents and fellowships, uh, fellowship, 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 so fellows in training. Sorry, uh, because um, it's not it's not very common for us to sit with an engineer and speak on just physical properties of materials, and I think that's something that we're lacking. So this is very yeah, good. I, very good. I think we can work on that. I yeah. think we can work yeah. on that, and we look forward to doing more. Yes, so. sir. Okay. Yeah, we've we've talked about as engineers doing more traveling too. We, it's kind of funny. Right before COVID, we had a group <laughs> of our group, basically of engineers talking. It's like we're going to start traveling more and talking to doctors and you know, tell them about engineering and let them tell us about their issues. Like I've never heard about that null guide wires breaking till now. That's yeah, this is, this is gold. always learn this something. Is, this type of interaction is gold, really. Yeah. Oh, but if um, I told you how many times uh, I've seen that. They, yeah, it's, it's, and I've seen it even, w I've seen the night, you know, the form by gravity just by having the heat of the light, the surgical lights. Mm -hmm. You'll see the wire supposed to yeah. hold its shape, and you'll yeah. see the wire totally melting upon being in contact with heat. So that's really concerning, you know. Uh, anyway, go ahead. No, I mean, that's still, hopefully, once things settle down, we'll be able to travel more. And if there's opportunities you see for us to come visit you, let us know. That would be great. That would be great. Okay, Juan, do you, anything else, Juan? Do you want to go over? No, or? no. This is a this is a great material. Uh, this I hope is going to be in YouTube, and lots of people are going to benefit. They're going to contact you for more information and see your products. Anything else you guys want to speak about, uh, Gerald? At all? Any parting words you want to say? Yeah. No, I think this has been awesome. Uh, great dialogue. Awesome questions and. Uh, just to your point, you know, the ability for us to interact with surgeons and share information that we have as well as learn from you guys is, is really critical for us developing good devices. I don't know if anybody else on the Medtronic team wants to chime in. Uh, I um, agree. No, I just I agree with you. Absolutely. And Dr. Buddy, I did want to say that um, uh, just due to, due to time, I would like to maybe have a, a future conversation on innovation and product just so that we can have a kind of a focus session there. And then, um, use that as another opportunity as well. It's all up to Dr. Bennett. Okay, yes, very good. Michelle, Michelle, you want to say something? No, I just echo everything everyone else said. I also okay. threw the paper on modular elasticity in the chat for your Yes, reference. thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, we'll edit this. We'll edit this and send it to all. And thanks everyone for participating. That was great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Have a nice weekend. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Okay, I'm I'm just stopping recording.